My name is uh, Dr. Dieter Paul. I'm one of the weight loss surgeons at Roger Williams Medical Center in Providence, Rhode Island. I wanted to talk to you today about what types of surgeries we're doing and show you little diagrams and take you through the whole process, give you the pros and cons of all the different surgeries so you have a better idea and can make a really good decision for yourself. What you will be seeing in the next few minutes is actually what I show all of my patients when they come to the office. I'll draw it there again on a piece of paper and everybody gets to take that piece of paper home to read through it, look through it, and there will be a lot more information in the office about all these procedures as well. All this information will also be on our website, loseweightri.com all one word, loseweightri.com. And if someone is interested in meeting with me or my two partners, Dr. Christian and Dr. Blumenthal, then you can just call the office up, 401-521-6310, 401-521-6310, to make an appointment on here, all these things live. Okay, I'll take you through the different surgery types. And we've been doing surgery here for about 20 years, so we have a good team. So all these surgeries are done with five or six small incisions, about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch here at Roger Wims Medical Center. And they're all done with general anesthesia, so people are asleep. So for most of these surgeries, if we didn't tell you what we're doing, you wouldn't probably know at the end what actually happened inside of you because everything else is pretty similar. The incisions are similar, the recovery is similar, and so forth. So the first surgery I will be talking about is the sleeve gastrectomy. Sometimes we refer to this also as the banana surgery because the end result looks like a small banana. So I always draw you here on this board what the starting situation is like. So in a Every person's body, there is the food pipe, the esophagus, which comes down through the chest. Then there is the stomach. And that's the actual organ, the stomach, which sits right here between the breasts. So that is actually where the organ, the stomach sits. Everything else down here, what the layman refers to as the stomach, is really fat and mostly intestines. So we're dealing with the stomach and some of the intestines. So it goes to the stomach, and then the first part of the small intestine here is called the duodenum, and from then it goes all the way down to the colon, and here's the colon. So in the real person, this is not a straight line, but this is all kind of curled up inside of us, like a ball of yarn. And the distance from here to there, all the area where a person can absorb food, depends on each person. It's different from person to person, but it's about uh, 15 to 25 feet. So it's a lot of small intestine to absorb the food. So for the sleeve, what we'll be doing is we will just basically be stapling stapling here. So this part of the stomach will be removed because it is completely disconnected from blood and so forth and it would just die and doesn't serve any purpose. So we'll remove about three quarters of the stomach gets taken out permanently forever out of the body. So the end result of the sleeve is again the food pipe and then this part here, and then it goes to the duodenum, and then this part here, and then it continues. Duodenum, all the small intestine, and then the colon. And a person still has all the small intestine of 15 to 25 feet to absorb food. 
calories, nutrients, everything. So that's all that we do with the sleeve. Basically create a smaller stomach, but two to three ounces in volume. So the next surgery I'll talk about is called the gastric bypass. Bypass. Sometimes we refer to this as the thumb surgery because the stomach at the end looks like a thumb. So again, we'll start with a normal anatomy. Esophagus, the food pipe, stomach, duodenum, and then all these small intestines going down to the colon. Same uh, length of intestines to absorb the food. So what we do for the gastric bypass is we will create also a small stomach, but it's up here. So we'll create a new stomach here. So this will be the new stomach. So the result is then the esophagus. Then it goes here, and then you have the new stomach. And that's about as big as my thumb. That's what we call the thumb surgery. Holds about half an ounce to an ounce in volume. And here we keep the rest of the stomach. It doesn't go away, it doesn't shrink, it just stays there. And it's still connected to everything else. That's why we can leave it in. It's not gonna rot, it's not gonna do anything bad, it's just gonna stay there. And the first part of the duodenum, all the duodenum here, and then it goes to the intestines. And then I will also cut the intestines. I'll cut them somewhere at this level here, in two. So when you do that, when you basically have a tube that you cut in the middle, you have two ends to it. So then I will essentially just t switch the orientation. I'll take the bottom one, the A, and move it up here and the top part of the intestines B, I'll connect further down here. Nothing gets taken out, everything will stay inside of the person. So now I'm gonna use red to show you that this part will go up here. So this part of the intestine gets it connected up here. So I'm just gonna fill this in so it shows it goes all over everything. So that's where the food will flow through later on. And the bottom one, B here, gets attached as well. So B is down here. So that gets attached. And then from there, it goes back to the colon. Like this. So this part where people still absorb the food and the nutrients and the calories is still going to be, depending on what the size of the person is, 15 to 20 feet. And the, this distance here, from here to here, the part that we essentially bypass, will be about three feet. So what happens in the gastric bypass is that a person still has 15 to 20 feet down here to absorb the food, the nutrients, the vitamins, and the calories. But up here, when a person eats, the portions will be very small, just like they are with the sleeve. And then whatever food a person still eats, it will go into this part of the intestines, which is about three feet long. And the good thing about this part of the intestines is there are no juices to digest the food because the juices that digest the food are actually here. This is where the majority of the ju juices are. There's also the pancreas that drains in here. And there is bile coming from the liver that drains in here. So all this together helps with digesting the food. And as you can see here, food bypasses this until this point, and from here on down is when people absorb 
the calories, the food, the nutrients. So here, people absorb everything because food goes down here and everything gets absorbed. In here, people absorb a little bit less because the length of the intestine where the juices are is less. So it's two mechanisms how people lose weight. The next surgery I'll talk about is called SADI. S-A-D-I. S. So again, for this surgery, we start with the esophagus, stomach, intestines, duodenum here, and then the small intestines, colon. So with this surgery, we start just like the sleeve, regular sleeve surgery. Maybe make that sleeve a little bit bigger because we don't need it that tight here. But the portions will still be small when person eating. So, and we'll take the rest out. So again, the result is the food part, the esophagus, and then the much smaller stomach. So now, in addition to the sleeve, what we're going to do is we're actually going to cut the intestines, precisely the duodenum, about an inch and a half behind the stomach. So not down here where we would cut it for the gastric bypass, a little higher up, up there. So then, there's a little bit of the duodenum here, and the rest of the intestines continues. The duodenum continues here, and then it goes down to all these small intestines here. Like that. But then, instead of this going all the way down here, we actually want to create a detour. We're going to move the intestines up here, attach them up there, bring them down there, and then go with the colon. And then we'll go with the colon. And remember, the juices that digest the food are here. This is where the pancreas comes in. This is where the bile comes in. Same thing here. The juices that digest the food are here. This is where the pancreas comes in. This is where the bile comes in. So they go all the way down here, but there's no food here yet. The food actually goes in here. That's where the food goes in. But the food can get digested, can't be broken up into little pieces because there's no juices to do that. Only when, this, when these juices reach the food here and then down in the last part of the intestines is when people can absorb the food. And we make this pretty precisely 10 feet here. From here to there is about 10 feet. We measure this inside the operating room, 10 feet. And the rest here is also about 10 feet, depending how much intestines a person has. Here, a person absorbs all the food and all the intestines. Here, it's a little bit less, about three to five feet less. Here, a person absorbs food only in about 10 feet. So the portions will still be small, but whatever the person eats, less gets taken up into the body, gets absorbed into the body. So it's an additional way of losing weight. So today, in 2020, most insurance companies don't pay for this yet. This will probably change in the future, but because they don't pay for it yet, there's actually another surgery which was before this year. It's been around for 20, 30 years. It's been done many, many, many times in the world, in the United States, and which is paid for by the insurance company without problems. 
And that procedure has another big long name. It's called biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. So it's a mouthful, just like this one. And when you come to the office or when you look on the website, it'll explain all these words. But for now, we just give it a little pet name. It's called DS, or duodenal switch. So this is the SADI, this is the DS. So the DS is essentially exactly that. So we're starting with this, we're doing this, so I'll draw you this as a starting position because you understand that by now. So we're doing this, so you have, a, um, you have the esophagus, you have the sleeve, you have the duodenum, and then you have this one here. So you have this, um, the rest of the duodenum going down here. And then you have all the small intestine. So this is just a SADI, just a normal SADI surgery. Goes up here, goes down there. Intestines are moved up here, down there. And then we'll go to the colon. And remember, this is 10 feet here. This is about 10 feet. So the only additional thing to the SADI that we're doing here right now is we're going to cut this one more time here. We're cutting this part of the intestine and then move that from here. This one goes down there. So this is all we're doing. And this part is actually very similar to what we do with the gastric bypass here. Doesn't look the same, looks very confusing, the gastric bypass, but this part is pretty much the same we're doing there. So it's nothing new. So for both of these surgeries, the sleeve we've been doing for a long time, the bypass part we've been doing for a long time, the new thing is really this connection here. So this is the one that's new. And the combination of everything. So the end result then is that you will have the esophagus, the sleeve, the first part of the intestine, and then this part stays the same. All this here stays the same. So you got that, goes down here. It's the same 10 feet. And then the colon. But we cut that. So we cut that in two. As I told you earlier, once you have a tube and you cut it, you have two ends. And the nice thing about intestines in the body is they're not completely rigid, they're not completely fixed. They are attached, so they're not completely free-floating either, but they are attached, but they can be moved around a little bit. So what we're doing, we're moving this one down there, and this stays the same. So this, again, the duodenum here stays the same. This all stays the same, and then it goes to the small intestine here. But instead of going back up, instead of going back up, small intestine gets attached here. So this is the new part, this connection here. We connect these two things here. This is the new part. So what happens now is you have five, so this is, was 10 feet here. Remember this was 10 feet, all this here was 10 feet. This was 10 feet. So that's a little split in half. So I got the lower part now, that's five feet. And you got the top part now, which is five feet. And coming back to our juices that digest the food, they're still up here. This is where they are. Here's the bile. Here's the bile coming in. And here's the pancreas juice coming in. Same thing here. All the juices that digest the food, pancreas, and bile. So now this, these juices go all the way down here. So the food that you eat, the small portions, go there. And then the food goes into the first five feet of the intestines. And in these five feet, there are still some hormones from the stomach, so you will get some absorption of food. But the majority will happen down here in the last five feet. 
So coming back to our numbers, there's some big numbers here. So here, you, a person will absorb food in 15 to 25 feet. Here, a person will absorb food in about five feet less, so 15 to 20 feet. Here, we pretty much precisely make it 10 feet, where a person absorbs the food. And here, the full absorption doesn't happen for five feet, and a little bit in the top five feet. So the shorter the distance is that a person absorbs food, the less they absorb, the more they lose weight. So that's why you can imagine now, I've showed you this in that, air, in that order, because from here to there is where how much food you will eat and how much weight you will lose. The more you go to this way, the more weight a person will lose. When they first started doing the surgeries, they actually made that distance here even shorter, one to two feet. But nothing unfortunately in life comes for free. So the more weight you lose, the less you absorb, there are also some disadvantages. So the advantages, you will lose a lot more weight the more you go to the right. The disadvantages, you will also have side effects, like you don't absorb vitamins sufficiently. You don't absorb protein and fats sufficiently. That's why, particularly for these two, which are very similar, these two are similar, a person will need to be really good with taking their vitamins. And they do have to take the specific ones that are made for weight loss surgery, the ones that we have in the office. For these ones, you can't just go in any store and buy any vitamins off the shelf. You have to get the ones from the office. They cost about a dollar a day. So it's not tremendously, but you have to think about it. The other thing is people need to be really reliable. Um, we always say this, that you need to follow up with us. You need to come to the appointments. You need to have your blood checked every about six months. But believe it or not, we have patients who don't even show up with their, for their first visit after surgery. And that is a little risky, a little dangerous. Actually, not a little risky, that's a lot dangerous. So particularly with these surgeries, don't do it. If you want them, if you want to have the best surgeries, then be a reliable person. See us regularly, have your blood checked, take your vitamins, and usually you're fine. But with any surgeries, there are risks. Um, in general, for any surgeries, even gallbladders, hernias, appendix, like bleeding, infection, heart problems, lung problems, blood clots, wound infections, wound hernias, injury to anything in here, leaking of some of the organs. Um, these things are not very often, but they do happen. But there are some more specific ones for each of these surgeries, and I'll go through them um, so you have an understanding of that. So for the sleeve, as you can see, this looks like the easiest surgery compared to all these other reroutings and so forth. Um, so the, the risks are also, in that regard, lower. There's still a risk that it can leak here. That means the juices don't run out. This doesn't heal well. The juices run out. And the person will get really sick for a while. This usually does not happen after a week, very rarely a few months later. Um, the other side effect here is that the person can get uh, acid reflux. Um, there's different numbers, but we see this regularly that we have a few people every year who have so, the reflux so badly that they actually need to have this turned over into a gastric bypass. The risk for the gastric bypass, again, is for leaking at the connections that we create. The other risk is that a person can develop a ulcer in this area where we connect the stomach to the intestines. And the ulcer can be so bad that this may actually burst, may break through, patient gets really sick, septic, peritonitis, and definitely needs surgery. You should come over, get over this, but it is another surgery. And again, we see this a few times a year. The other thing that does happen is patients can get a blockage here, or in this area here, intestinal blockage, which always requires surgery at that point. Most patients with these surgeries are more constipated. The specific risks for the SADI, again, there's a sleeve there, so similar risks apply. 
Um, and then there is another connection here, so again, it can leak. Um, and this is a spot that's different from leaking, maybe a little bit more difficult to treat, but it can be treated. People usually do not get an ulcer here, so this is different from that connection. People, this is a benefit, they do not get an ulcer here, does not break through. And for some reason, people also do not get bowel blockages very often here compared to the gastric bypass. But as I said, a person needs to take their vitamins. That's one important thing. And some people get the fact that they don't absorb vitamins so badly that we actually have to move some of the intestines around with surgery to adjust that. The other uh, thing that's different is that, as I said, with these two surgeries, a person is oftentimes more constipated. With this surgery, a person can expect to have about two to three bowel movements a day. And it's looser, it's not usually constipated hard, it's more loose. But it can go so far that some people actually get diarrhea. And that may not be a problem, but if it does become a problem, there is a surgery to fix that. Oftentimes that depends also on what kind of food a person eats. And our dietitians are well equipped to help you, guide you through this. And the DS essentially has the same risks here, and there's one more connection, so you could get a problem here. Again, this is a very standard connection, uh, like the gastric bypass, and we haven't had any leaking of this connection here for many, many, many years, so this is very highly unlikely. Bowel blockage could happen here too, but for some reason it's less here than it is with a bypass. So these are roughly the risks that I wanted to explain to you. And again, if you have questions, we can talk about this in the office. Um, so now the good part, why a person may you choose one or the other. As I said earlier, it's all about losing weight and getting the best result out of it. So with all these surgeries, a person will lose weight initially without problems. This is what the surgeries do. They help you lose weight. They make it easy for the first six months to a year. A person will lose weight quickly, um, automatically, and can't really help it. They're losing weight. So the first year is the honeymoon because everything is very beautiful and everybody's happy. After that, most people will get a little hungry again. The appetite will come back. And then it's important that a person does change some of her eating habits a little bit. Um, if you don't change eating habits, then oftentimes the weight can come back. For most people, just a little bit, but very rarely a lot. So for me, as a physician, as a doctor, the most important thing is actually not the first year, but the most important thing is five years after surgery, 10 years after surgery, 15 years after surgery. That's what we're doing this for. And also for the medical problems, I want you to be off your diabetes medications even 15 years from now, not just the first year. So that's why we are in this, and hopefully you too. So in terms of how much weight can you lose, let's say about five years afterwards. And there are lots of different numbers out there from different programs, different surgeons. So I'll give you a rough estimate. So please don't quote me exactly for one or the other. It's a rough estimate, and it's an average. That means some people do super great, and some people don't do good at all. And that oftentimes has not to do with how we do the surgery, because it's a very routine thing. Oftentimes that has to do with what a person does a year or two later. Because with all these surgeries, if a person eats food with a lot of calories, they may put up more weight than other people. Even though, the per, the, even though the portions may be small, let's say a handful you can eat after five years, if that handful is cupcakes, that'll be 500 calories. If that handful is broccoli, that'll be 50 calories. So the person has a big influence in all this. And again, our dietitians will be helpful in guiding you through this. So how much weight can you lose? So roughly, as an average, with this one, after about five years, I'll write this here, maybe up here, five years. 
So with a sleeve, you can expect to lose about 20%. So 20% means for every 100 pounds that you weigh, you will lose 20 pounds. So a person who weighs 200 pounds will lose about 40 pounds. A person who, loses, who weighs 300 pounds will on average lose about 60 pounds. Okay, so that's what percentage means. So for the gastric bypass, it's more 20 to 30 percent. Okay, so that means for every 100 pounds that you weigh, a person will lose about 20 to 30 pounds. So the person who weighs 200 pounds will lose 40 to 60. And the person who weighs 300 pounds will lose 60 to 90 pounds. But let's just take the person who weighs 300 pounds. So if that person loses 30%, which is a good weight loss for a gassy bypass, that person will lose 90 pounds, so 300 minus 90 is still 210 pounds. So we will, with the surgery, get you to a very nice low weight, but you may, and you, you may like that weight, this is maybe what your goal is, but it might not be what's considered a healthy weight. That's where these two surgeries come in. Though these two are similar, you can expect to lose about 30 to 40 percent of your current body weight. So coming back to the people who weigh 200 pounds. So for the person who weighs 200 pounds, that means a weight loss of about 60 to 80 here. Same thing, 60 to 80 pounds of weight loss here. So the 200 pound person will go down to about 120 pounds, to 140 pounds. And the person, same thing with the DS, the person who weighs 300 pounds will go down to 210 pounds or 40% to 180 pounds. So this is what the average is. There are people who lose more, there are people who lose less. But this is what kind of like rough numbers for about five years after surgery. And the other benefit obviously is the more a person loses for some medical problems, the better it will be. Like all these surgeries will help you with all the medical problems, particularly at the beginning. Some of the medical problems may come back if a person gains weight back. Um, these two are the best for particularly diabetes. They have the highest chance of uh, getting rid of diabetes and keeping the diabetes off. They're also in terms of how the blood sugar is going throughout the day, they are the, the most uh, stable. So with the gastric bypass, even though the sugar may be really good, the sugar values throughout the day may go up and down, up and down. With this one, studies have shown that they're more or less stable, constant, so there's no so much of a variation. So this is an overview. I know it's very complicated. Um, even for us surgeons, it's very complicated. Um, but I hope I made it easier uh, to understand, clearer, uh, so you can make a better decision what's best for you. And we can talk about this in the office. Obviously, we as surgeons may have an idea of what may be best for you. For example, if someone here has a body mass index of 50 or 60, which is a really high body mass index, means, which means they weigh a lot for their size, for their height. So for a person like that, this is probably the better surgery versus this one here. Um, but again, that's individual. If you have any concerns, talk to us in the office and we'll help you through this.